What's to read it? EML file, and that's the one which you should um, exercise a little caution when loading up into your computer. Um, I'll explain a bit more as I go through this talk for you. Okay? 
So I'm glad no one's actually had a chance to do it. I, I was seriously expecting someone to have gone and powered up the machine and stick their hand up in order to say, uh, what does the message I am vulnerable mean? Uh, to see this on hard disk, you know. I was just expecting that to occur before we got the way. Okay? Now, what can I actually say before I actually move on to the first slide here? Well, I'm going to outline what's possible. I'm going to reveal, hopefully, a few extra mechanisms which worms could actually replicate by it. I'm doing this in part of trust, and I'm hoping no one in this room will go and implement anything along these lines. Nothing I'm revealing is uh, not being on bug track before, but um, I hope people don't think I'm do it. So, let's first of all, let's look at the description of what a network worm is. Moved on. Okay, now this is a kind of description of a network worm. It's more as a catch-all description. I've designed it to be too general. I know it catches things which aren't network worms, but hopefully it includes everything that could possibly be remotely classed as some form of network worm. And I've put it down as two separate statements. The first one is a program which spreads itself in a network environment with or without human help. The old description, I would have stated it without any human assistance. That's the difference between a worm and a virus. But, as we know, many of the worms which we are used to be quoted as worms in the media today require human activity in order to spread. Another option is the fact that uses standard services, i.e. normal capabilities of your system, designed and planned capabilities of your system in order to spread, or exploit system holes. In combination, this means we can have essentially four types of viruses in combining those two. And or, if a virus utilizes more than one method of replication and transmission, it could be all of the above. So we've actually got a very wide statement about what is a network worm. So, let's have a look at a couple of examples. Now, I only mean a couple of examples, but I am not going to go through who's who the network worm. We, to me, we'd be here all afternoon. Now, I don't know if anyone wants to be here all afternoon, but I don't. So I'm just giving you a couple of examples here. I'm sorry if you're the worm you wrote isn't up on this list. Is it? <laughs> we have got a camera. <laughs> okay, well, sorry if that's the case, but we can always the case. But anyway, there's a couple of examples of there for you, just some examples of worms which utilize standard services in order to spread. Now, essentially, these worms aren't doing anything outside the standard performance criteria designed into the system. Now, we might be able to question a couple of the manufacturer's choices in having decisions, like being able to automatically access your address book and send tons of emails. I'm sure Microsoft had it to any spam email program writers, but it is a capability which still is added into the system. Not a security hole, but something which is there. And here we have a few a couple of examples. The I love you were VBS script, is itself email, we've all know it, we've all seen it. And a more modern bomb, which is currently running around and causing probably the greatest problem at the moment of any of the network worms, even though it isn't getting the publicity, is perhaps Circa, which is another example of a worm which spreads via email as its primary mechanism. But there are other mechanisms which worms can spread by, using legitimate services, such as file shares, which Circa also exploits. There's other ones as well, such as IRC and news groups and so on. There's just two examples of this. They're just spreading using standard services set up on computers, not using any security holes per se. Most of these type of worms need some sort of human input in order to operate. The reason is, as you're using a legitimate service, it often requires a click from a user in order to run or execute or download an attachment or run an attachment. The only problem is, users are thick and tend to download and run these things, as we all know. And this is how they actually can work. 
But it's not the only type, of course. Of more interest are probably the average howlers in the are actually the type of words which spread without requiring a user's input. The ones we tend to exploit system holes in the computer system, no running on, or attacking. And as we can see, we've got a couple of famous ones on board there, including the Code Red, Code Red 2, and of course the Internet Word, the original Morris Word. Each of these utilizes holes and flaws in particular services. None of these services have been well known about and patched for a while. For example, Code Red utilizes one which was revealed in June this year. They rely on system admins mainly, not patching or maintaining secure systems. And that's how they're not able to break in. There's been other examples such as the Raven on Unix and so on. But even so, the fact that these sites, those people have got sites insecurely connected to the internet, machines with security holes on them, makes them vulnerable for attack. And it's perhaps at this point I really wish someone had a wireless card and were in range and absolutely gone and run that worm, because it would have shown that how attendee can tell with a vulnerability on their own computer. Most people don't bother patching. It's a relatively few people who bother about security. I know I'm speaking to the converted in this room, but as we all know, the bulk of people, bulk of system admins, often take security to be an inconvenience rather than something that they should implement. So this is what we've got here, and hopefully that gives you a bit of understanding of some of the standard worms and systems which we've got out there at the moment. But, okay, that's a worm. Well, let's now look at what actually makes worms a success. Or should I perhaps say really a disaster or a problem? Because, let's be truthful, if you were to look on sources like viruslist.com or any of the other major archives of viruses and worms out there, you'll find there's about a couple of hundred worms or worm variants, of which only a few generally gain, essentially become famous or become a major problem. Why is this? Well, this is perhaps the biggest bugbear over the construction of worms, and this is why we've had to be very lucky up till now. Most of the worms that have been produced have been very amateurish in their construction. I doubt there's any worm which can actually say that it's actually been constructed of all elements to be successful. Yeah, no, I <laughs> now, let me just uh, take you through and just explain through each one of these initially. The first one I've got there is small size. In other words, the worm itself should be as small relatively as possible. Why? A small worm can travel faster, quicker, takes less bandwidth up in order to transmit. It also takes less time to download. The bulk of people who are vulnerable to most worm infections are uneducated users. Uneducated users tend to be using the lowest bandwidth. You tend to find on average the person who's just got the standard 56k modem at home, the old version of got Windows 98 loaded onto the laptop, and that could go for 95, tends never to actually bother concerned about the computer. And but if they're accessing the email or something like that, it starts taking a long time to download, but turn it off. This is perhaps a surprise why SIRCAM has become such a problem. It's about 130k in size. Now, the average cable modem, the average ADSL line, this isn't a problem, or some other corporate network. But for a home user, it's pretty noticeable, it's a pretty big bit of attachment. Especially with an AOL user, it'll take forever for it to download. <laughs> if you saw, I had AOL on this machine, so I know from first hand experience about that. So, the small, small size is something which is a lot of a problem. So, I can't win in Delphi. Um, surprisingly, most people seem to write them in high level languages now. Why? But if they wrote the slower language, you'd have a much very bigger problem on hands. We also got another problem in the fact that worms are always more successful if they target inexperienced system administrators or users. Now, we all know that essentially, depending on what operating system someone uses, they are more likely to be more skilled in terms of maintaining security and look after it than other operating systems. 
If you've got someone at home who's running, say, a version of BSD Unix, I'm not going to get into the fish versus devil debate, but if you're using some version of BSD on your computer, odds are you probably, A, know about security holes, B, likely to go and patch your system if ever anything happens, and C, be an experienced user who knows when suspicious behavior is occurring. If you are a Windows 98 user who's just gone to college to learn a basic how to word process course, you won't have any clue. And the work which targets this sort of population is going to be more successful. It's going to be more successful than one which targets a more, essentially a group of users more technically advanced. And we all know about, most of us know about IRC worms, but IRC users tend to have to be more knowledgeable users than someone who just ordinarily browses the web and uses email. Again, those worms are going to have less overall impact on the internet. So in reality, this is something which we've got to take into account when worms are written. I'm not going to comment about Windows 2000 system admins with code red, but um, I'm sure we all know what I mean when I'm talking about this. They are normally better than your average user of a normal PC, but uh, many of them, I say, aren't necessarily skilled in security. Some of them are. Okay? Can't tell. But the key point is the fact if you were to target like Windows 95 and 98, it's going to have more impact. And that's probably why Sircan is more dangerous out there than the likes of Code Red. What else does a worm need to be to be a major success? Well, it needs to be able to have an effective replication mechanism in order to spread, and an infection mechanism in order to spread. Now, I'm sure everyone here has seen the press reports about the difference between Code Red 1 and Code Red 2 over its infection capability. But Code Red 2 tries IP addresses essentially at random, which is a pretty inefficient mechanism because the internet domain space, as we all know, is relatively sparsely populated with servers, and it ends up trying to ping sites which are not machines which aren't connected, no machines ever connected to the IP number, or essentially run operating systems on virtual random. Code Red 2, though, utilizes a slightly better mechanism, and it tends to attack IP addresses in the close range to the original machine. And as we all know with server farms and organizations, if an organization has one Windows 2000 machine, machine in, how likely is it going to have more than one? How do organizations run all operating all the major operating systems? Only the largest, or maybe something like top academic institutes tend to do that. Most people tend to more standardize on one, two, or three platforms. As a result, this means the fact that it's able to spread faster, even though we're using the same security exploit in order to gain access. Even though the people who started patching systems after Code Red 1, so the overall infectable population was less. So in other words, the replication method needs to be effective, and there's a large number of worms who have very ineffective replication mechanisms. Perhaps it's because people can't test them, or don't test them. Is the reason for this? I don't know. All I'm saying is I'm relatively glad that in most cases they don't. But what else makes a worm a success? The new one is gain publicity. It's a two edged sword, this one. Many worm writers probably want the press and publicity that their worm has done a lot of damage. But if it becomes well known, people learn to recognize it and not fall for it or learn how to secure against it. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword, this case. But if it does become popular, you'll find people on the internet will download it and launch it off again for them, for the worm writer. So this one's a bit of a, what's the word, a grey area in terms of the great um, sense of publicity the worm achieves. But let's look at something else. 25 minutes coming. Next one is payload isn't easily defeated. Let's use Code Red 1 as an example. You've all heard about its denial of service attack. It was due to launch against the White House. It didn't launch against the domain name, it launched against an IP number. So, guess what they did? 
change our IP number, defeat this attack, defeated. If you were to send an hour service by sending, say, a set 40 byte packet payload or something to refer to a site, that traffic is so unusual that it's relatively easy to filter it out at the ISPs of the chain and or the site itself. So essentially, if you are one of the going to be a devil effect, the, essentially the damage attack or payload needs to be something which, what's the word, is um, not easily disabled and defended against, or appears to be on the traffic. So that would actually make a worm far more deadly if that was the case. But what else does a worm need to be potentially to be successful? Well, a large infectable population is best. In fact, the ideal situation for a worm is a monoculture. In other words, where all we've got is essentially the same systems. This is not an attack on Microsoft, I'll just make this clear at this point here. No matter what the monoculture was, really, and I think some people may disagree with that tomorrow afternoon, but I don't think actually it really matters what monoculture is. The monoculture is a bad idea. That's what happened in Ireland with the potato famine. If you rely on one crop to support your country and that crop gets infected and you lose it, you've got a major problem. The same applies here. And we've got a lot of people using similar systems, namely Windows. Connected using the same communication mechanism, aka the internet, using the same protocols and procedures for the communications. This is a situation completely right for worms to actually activate in such an environment. Um, essentially this, if you've got a large population always the same thing, then trouble. Next thing is the fact that the, the worm is correctly coded. Good number of worms fail because of programming errors. And when looking at them, looking at analysis of them all, getting the code and looking at themselves, you suddenly realise the people that wrote them, you wonder how on earth they managed to get past the first year of university, or even sometimes even to do a basic programming course. There's a lot of problems in them. Maybe it's because they can't test them, and they don't go the effort of testing them. Thankfully, that was used. <laughs> So, thankfully, it's used, but thankfully, people don't. Now, are there any worms which actually use all of those? Who meet all those criteria? Fortunately, at the moment, no. But it wouldn't take much to write one to actually meet those criteria. The final one, though, is the one which makes me the most nervous to spend this talk, and that is being an untraceable source for worm. Because a worm isn't too much use for its author if it gets tracked back to them and they end up being put in jail. And what makes me a bit worried about this is um, the ideal place to distribute such a thing would be, say, as a large meeting with several thousand possible authors with a wireless access network. <laughs> don't! Number one, I don't want to have to have interviews about because, A, I'm sure the fact that if anything did get released, I'd be the first one they ended up talking to. I want to go back home. Number two, you probably, A, at least get the internet link knocked off on how. And number two, three, it may actually result in the whole thing being essentially not being able to run the event like this again. So I essentially advise people, but in the greatest, most strongest terms, not to actually write these sorts of things. Okay. Now, and no, I'm not being hypocritical, okay? And I don't write words, okay? And as you'll see with the proof of concept, I've not got the replication code in the program. So, this is what will make a worm a success, and able to be released and not found out the author is, spread effectively, gain a lot of publicity, and to do a lot of damage. And the music called success in the viewpoint from the worm author's viewpoint, a disaster from and no worm has ever made all of these criteria. But, here's the point. What can a worm do? What do worms do at the moment in terms of attack and payload? And what can they do in the future? Well, let's have a look at the most common attack which they often use for. 
And that is to distribute, essentially a distributed denial of service attack. What I've got here is an example of a very cut down version of the internet. You'll see the large black line should be viewed as a backbone link, the same to say two ISPs. The individual dots radiating into each one is the individual clients connecting into that ISP. Very cut down view of it. The other machines are ones which have been infected. The red one is one which has been targeted by a denial of service attack. I don't really know whether which method of denial of service you're going to use or be used against the particular site, but let's say it's used just a standard hosing attack, sending too much data. If all the other yellow sites send data through, the wet red site is going to find its link to its ISP becoming saturated. If that traffic is in such a way that the ISP cannot distinguish it from normal legitimate traffic, it's going to be very difficult for that site to make effective use of its line. Okay. How would you do that? Well, there's several ways it could be done. Like, for example, instead of sending an 80 byte payload or still sending a pure data stream, you kept requesting the web page of the target web server all the time, essentially to eat up the traffic. It appears to be coming from a browser, it's relatively hard to, to differentiate between them. This is pretty much standard. But unfortunately, this could be taken further. Now, we started to hear media talking about how the red worm, the first one, was wrecking the internet link and no one could get through. It was only causing a minor impact. But worms could be targeted to cause a major denial of service. Here we see all the sites of one ISP being infected trying to talk through to the target site another ISP. I've never yet come across an internet service provider or network which could handle the actions of every single one of its users running at full speed out at the same time. In other words, ISPs tend to be blocking. If that was to occur, the link between the two ISPs would become saturated. Now, I'm not talking about necessarily across the entire internet. But it wouldn't take too much to design a worm to target certain key points in an internet. If we were to look at a country, say the Netherlands, or say the United Kingdom, for example, there's relatively few, shall we say, points of access into that country. It wouldn't take much to design a cis worm which would distribute and saturate those lines. It could cause quite a bit of problem for an individual country or individual network. This is something which I feel is like to start occurring in the future. I'm not sure necessarily how we can defend against it. But that's not all that network worms could actually go and start coming out and doing. There's this as well. Oops. How about publicity? We've already seen examples of one example of um, should we say, a worm going around and supporting, should we say, a, I'd say a kind of terrorist group or organisation. Have you seen any worms yet for environmental activist groups or so on? No? Not yet. Have we seen any spam worms yet? Do you honestly think they're not going to be released for the latest pyramid selling scheme? I think it's coming. So, publicity. Good advert. Let's go to people's systems, pop up an advert. Changing television publicity as well as acting on people's computers. We can also have the standard destruction and corruption of data, which is actually relatively rare in worms. Very, very small percentages of them even contain such a error. But we have other problems. This one revealing of data. We all remember Melissa. We all remember now Sircam. They start mailing out a document of your system to someone else. Embarrassing. Revealing your trade secrets. I'm most interested to know, I don't know if anyone here will be able to in the question section answer this, but what happens to your copyright ownership of a file if you mailed it out to your competition? hope someone can answer that for me. 
Even so, this can perhaps be far more dangerous for a company organization than the deletion. We can also have other things that work can do. It can actually go in and fix a system. We've already had like, one case of this, haven't we, with the bind exploit. Admittedly, the author did put back, um, back door systems it went into, but uh, if you'd actually written it, you could write a worm which would go through and automatically fix systems, and that's pure job. Still legal, but you know, it's an example form which probably would be morally, potentially justifiable. We can also have worms which essentially trojanize the system and put back door, aka code red 2 by popping the root the cmd.exe to root.exe and uh, Trojanized Version Explorer on the system. This actually though is pretty silly because I mean all they've done is took an insecure system and made it an insecure system. The system had a vulnerability of the work to get in the first place. People could have still exploited it. So this isn't perhaps as big a problem as people are outlining. And when I look at the press coverage of Code Red 2, I'm looking at it going, hmm, okay. I failed to see really the major issue with it in terms of that point, in terms of this. But the final one, to hide your actions, is something which I don't know if any of you have noticed. It's happening quite a lot on the internet at the moment. Everyone who's got a machine connected, who's got anything up on port 80, is probably getting a lot of requests for a certain .ida file. Anyone receiving them on the system? About 60 or 70 a day? 800 in two days. In about eight hours. Okay. When you're getting all these occurring, has anyone ever looked at the sites which are making these requests as soon as the request has been made in other words to avoid people connecting on a dynamic IP and disconnecting? I have in my system. I found some coming from BSD boxes. It wasn't the word. Someone's using it and just being an excuse because they can scan tons of machines on the internet. No one's going to pick up it's not the worm which is doing it. I know that's strange but true. We're looking to see if the idea, idea, idea is there and probably looking for a 200 code coming back. But even so, it's actually, you know, that's what people are seem to be doing, they're having actions. I've had four, four IP numbers uh, recorded on that. I'm sure if you check your logs, you may find something similar. It's a minority, but People can hide in amongst the crowd. So those are what we've got there in terms of basically what's possible with worms in terms of the payload. However, it's not the payload is necessarily a problem. Most of these are conventional methods of attack. What's going to be kind of become the big problem in the future is well, in addition to people coding worms better, they're going to use new types of replication. At the moment, only a few security holes and a few types of methods are used for words to spread. We know this is going to change. The popularity generated from the likes of these words, such as Code Red, has every, should we say, learning programmer who wants to cause harm saying, oh, great, I want to write a worm. Some of these are eventually going to discover bug track. And they're going to start having a look at it. And they're going to look, and they've got to probably look at the services they have on their computer, which will probably be Windows. And they're going to look, and they're going to look, and they're going to look and say, hey, great, I'm going to need to look at something. Like maybe Internet Explorer. Great, let's see if there's a security hole that could use that. Can I make a web worm, which is actively active by a web browser? And the answer, of course, is a definite yes. George Beninsky, very good at discovering security holes in certain Windows products, particularly Internet Explorer. Now, the one which I'm going to show you in a moment, the proof of concept, doesn't use a security hole in real, but there's tons of these out there. And most people don't bother with them. I know many security experts who never bother upgrading and essentially securing their copy of Internet Explorer. Okay? And, or Netscape, or whichever browser they happen to use. Okay. There's a lot of major security holes in here. As a result, okay, it's possible to write worms that spread by the web. And there's a whole range of ways you can do it. The old, what is a word, the flash problem which occurred, a 
Flash DA, go on Flash, most people have upgraded the version of Flash, Java problems, and so on. Okay? Now, that's what that What we're going to look at now, though, is we're going to look at proof of concept one using a security hole in Internet Explorer. This proof of concept one just shows you how potentially such a worm can actually operate. It is not complete the code. Okay, there's some things in it to make it bit essentially harder to modify it to make it a worm finally than it would be to write again from scratch. But it does show and demonstrate the potential ability of this operating. And some of you might want to run this at home. If you do, I take no responsibility for your computer whatsoever. You're all warned about this. The only place where this URL is going up is here, and I'll be removing it in seven days. So just so you're aware of it, okay? Uh, I advise you to open it and rather save it and have a look at it first. But even so, let's have a look at it. Now this security hole is actually book track 2524 number. Now it's not by George Minsky, it's by, I believe, Duck, John Rubio Garcia, no. John Carlos, no. Juan Carlos Diego Garcia. Sorry about that. See, if you list, look at book track, it's listed who discovered the screw time. Okay. This list of code is based around a very, very basic file. And the basic utilizes a line mapping problem. Looking at here is the file on the website. And it's you running on a vulnerable web browser, which needs to be IE5 or 5.5, uh, pre-March 2000. One, aka default Windows 98 installs, early Windows 2000 unpatched, and also, of course, a um, variety of other Microsoft platforms as well. Now, has anyone here not patched the copy of it? Uses 5 or 5.5 and has not patched it since March. One person, two people. So, there's a few people this should actually work on. Okay? Um, hands up if you don't run Internet Explorer. <laughs> right, good. Okay. Now, let's have a look at this one. So here's the code. I say don't have a go try to complete it, please. But if you have a look at it here, it runs. If you have affected system, it runs. You can access an EML file, which is essentially for Outlook. But Internet Explorer can be tricked using media players to launch the thing. And here it has done, and it's popped up the text, you're vulnerable, see word.bbs. At this point, the BBS script has been written to the, to the drive C, word.bbs. As you probably gather, this word, this BBS script has been executed on the computer, which means it could contain anything. It could contain a word code. This distribution mechanism works for executables and all sorts of other methods of executable the programs, another type we're going to look at in a moment. So as a result, it's gone wrong. That was the ML, constructed as you can see, and it contains at the bottom, just off the bottom of the page there, the actual BBS source code, which if we have a look over the page here, um, it doesn't work if you've got Media Player 7 on the computer, by the way, only if you've got the earlier version. This is the VB script, which is in it. And as you can see, it's got the basics at the bottom of regenerating the EML file when it runs. It doesn't do, but it could do, it could just write it out and recreate the EML file. 2.5k in size, easily completed in the side 5k, it makes it very, very small. Okay? That is a potential of how you could actually have a web enabled room. Expect to start seeing them appearing. Now, like I say, it would target a lot of users, not most of the people in this room. But it's an example of one which could operate. Now, if you were to write such a word, all you need is this level of design code experience to produce this sort of design schematic. Bit quick. Oops, should have put that one up just now. <laughs> so that would actually be a way of doing it. But are there other problems? Are there legitimate services which could cause us major problems for worm spreading? 
And the answer is yes. Any AOL users in this room? Now, I'm not knocking AOL, I've done a count of them, I'll just hide behind the podium as people throw objects. But if you have an AOL account, AOL lets you log on with your member name and username. But did you know that uh, once users are logged in, they access the web space by running FTP to that web address? The ID of the enter is anonymous, and their password is their email address. Is this manna from heaven for a worm? There's only 30, about 30 million subscribers, each with five to seven addresses, with all the web space available. Okay, now I'm not just picking on them, there's certain large ISPs in Britain who've done similar things, like when the software was initially installed, writing a password out for their account to a text file, for example, on the computers. It happens a lot of organisations, I'm not just picking on AOL here. This is well known about to be known about for ages. It's not a security hole because it only works if the user's logged on on that account. But for a worm, if the worm gets the person's system and runs, it could then be used. They're not the only culprit though. This is where I pop over to Microsoft. I could have picked versus any kind of large organisation, so I'm not picking on them yet. But this is a service provided by Microsoft known as HTML applications. Generally not classified in major security advisories, but it's an actual service provided. The CAC worm virus, the email virus, uses it at uh, .hta is to spread. But the main advantage of HTA is was to be used on the web. Now, I took this from Microsoft's website. That is the URL from there. That's the little snippet out there for them. Um, there are some restrictions in there, but when you look at this, you'll see it's designed to run seamlessly without interruptions, turns off security access controls, read out and write access to the files and system registry. You can pop a .hta file on a website, people can go to it, and it'll run on their computer with their privileges on their own machine, be able to do what they want. Now, I know it's not necessarily a major security flaw, because Internet Explorer does ask the user, what they want to do with it. But how many people are going to go and click the top one? A .hta could easily be used in fact web file, HTML files, launching a frame to launch your HTA. And some users are going to click open and run it. It can infect all the HTML, you can have it infect all the HTML files on the home computer. Uh, it uses mshta.exe to run on your computer. Um, so if you're the kind of person who goes and deletes cmd.exe and Windows 2000 and want to, might want to get rid of this one, uh, watch out for the one versions of it installed by service packs, by the way. Like with most of um, Windows services if you remove them. But even so, this is another example. There are many more examples which I could give. I hope it's just giving me a point here that we're lucky that many, many word writers don't actually go and look out for this information. A lot of this stuff's on book track or in official documents on the website of the organisations like AOL has on its site details of the password for all subscribers. It tells them how to do it. So, I'm fully aware that it's now getting reasonably close towards the end of the time because I need to finish off at least five minutes before the end to our next speaker get a chance to speak. But essentially, what do we expect to happen in the next, say, 12 months? Regrettably, we're going to see more work starting to appear. We're going to see new types starting to appear. And I do hope the media stop picking up on them as much, because it, I feel it does encourage more people to write them. Okay. We're going to find there's more media coverage of them, as this, so that people start to write them better. And I regret we're probably going to get more legislation appearing. Now I say regretfully, because my general opinion of legislation is there's enough legislation in our own Britain to put people away for years for writing nice computer network work. I think we're going to get more, and the problem is this legislation probably won't be drafted as well as it should be, and I generally just know that security experts follow the law, and it may very well end up stopping us coming up with solutions which should work. But what are the solutions? Well, the most obvious solution is make sure you secure your site. If you use the standards indicated by your manufacturer, if you want a machine independent standard, there's one up there we wrote uh, the, the Internet Security Council. It's on open publication license, so you're free to copy it, print it, 
show it to your managers and so on. Okay? That's what we need people to start securing the systems, taking security seriously. We also need to look at the people start filtering traffic on their backbones in order to look how traffic can be filtered. Perhaps this might be legitimate use for the UK's black boxes going in. I'd like to see, generally, if governments are going to put black box into ISPs, they are actually useful and helpful rather than just on the monitoring. It'd be great if that was the case. Remember, there are only a few ways into each country. If a network worm came out, start to spread out there, it is just about possible to start closing the gates to maybe stop it getting into stopping its spread. It's worth looking at that. We also need to look at the automatic patching of systems and upgrading in relation to security homes. And I think there's going to be a big market in the next 12 months of people pasting and selling programs which will say, this program will react to the latest network worm infection, automatically update your system to get rid of the, the problem. I think we're going to see that more than standard antivirus packages which we've seen at the moment. And we also need worldwide action of people cooperating, and ISPs cooperating, and users cooperating. How many people here have logs of people of the code red two worm or code red one worm probing their system? How many keep your hand up if you're actually putting measures to contact the sites which are infected? One. <laughs> two. Right. Remember what these users wouldn't know. Well, the ISP, if you contacted the ISPs and so on. Might be able to get some of them to get them fixed and fix their systems. Okay, I know some will probably threaten you with legal action as well, but it's still worth a try to have a go at that. We do need the fact that people responsibly should act responsibly. And if you get probed by a system which you know is infected, it's at least courtesy to try and let them know, or try and do try and let their ISP know. It's not too difficult to ask in relation to. Well, this section I think is a good point for me to start bringing this section to close because that will give us about five minutes to ask if anyone to ask any questions. So I'd like to begin to start there. Okay. Okay, any questions? Just five minutes. Yes. In this case, I don't think it was. Um, the, the, that machine in that case was connected by a dynamic, dynamic IP address. I got it muted, it was when it was connected. It didn't seem to be uh, a company firewall or stuff on that. Um, I've got a feeling that people are, some people are hiding behind it. Okay. I will accept though that can happen. That can happen. As we all know, the old trick, which and I don't know if you do it, but I do it as well, which is having a Linux box IP chains on and routing different services to different boxes behind. And uh, if you scan the box, it comes out that you can't work out what fake system it is because it, like, it's Linux. But strange, like this comes through to an IIS machine. You know, these sort of things. Um, you never necessarily can trust what they said. Yeah, I think that's a good question. You think it deserves a T-shirt? <laughs> Do you want something by Love You virus source code a bit of a time? <laughs> the DNS competition from last year's competition. Can you make sure it gets back to him? I'll, I'll throw a couple more into orders in a moment in that direction. Okay, any more questions? <laughs> Big companies should pay immensely to security. In fact, one of my biggest bugbears is that people, to companies, and organisations tend not to pay as much attention to security as they need. And yes, anyone can write these poems. In the basic script language, it's very easy to do.
Okay, any more questions? I'd love to get to a free shirt, it always does that. I mean, maybe so we'll have to take two more questions, I'm afraid, but we'll go. Yeah, go on. Yes. Um, however, you could necessarily make it so the fact that there are ways you could design a success system to avoid it. The current update programs available from, say, Microsoft and also, let's like, say, from Red Hat um, aren't a solution. But I think there's potential there for actually raising the alarm and again, distributing a patch out to the appropriate machines. And yes, I agree that the distributing such a patch would cause a load of the, net, of the network and which may, in some cases, be worse than the worm itself. <laughs> uh, out, out so I'm just going to throw this next one into the audience, because I need to bring it to a close. So um, I'll just throw this one out. Right? I know the next speaker will want to get on. I guess, uh, <laughs> Which broke Byros out or not? <laughs> Who says yes? yes? I'm probably going to get in trouble for this, you know. Are the cameras turned off? No. Okay. Keep your eye on these. Not so Okay then. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. Bye for now.